So I'll just get started here quick. I've got a few announcements. Um, the first is, of course, as, as you've seen in the tutorials uh, today and yesterday, that two memos have been posted to the course website. Those memos um, are the first of two. There might be three or four by the end of the semester. Memos are a professional way that companies use for communication internally. And these memos set the course project. They tell you what the focus of the course project is, and they tell you the expectations for the deliverable sometime in November. In those memos are some important pieces of information along the way, which I'm assuming you've read. And they cover things regarding meetings that you will have to have with me and meetings that you need to set. So less than half the groups have emailed a proposed meeting time to me. So that's something that you, your group should still do if you haven't done. Um, during those meetings, you will set a group chairperson. That chairperson will run the meeting, and it will be a review of the work you've done, as well as questions that you have for myself and the external reviewer. Okay, so that's coming up in November. Make sure that you get those, um, those bookings done in time for that. The second piece of information from my, my side on the announcements is regarding the midterm. And you've gone through this collaborative process for the midterm. Now, I've hoped what my goal with that was obviously that you review the midterm with three other people in your group of four. But more strongly than that, I've hoped that that process has demonstrated the utility of group work. Right? Your group should have come up with a solution that was probably better than the solution you, you wrote in the midterm. Okay. Because you've got three other perspectives there. And that's the real learning that took place, was actually in those tutorials today. The midterm is just a way for you to, in, it's a mechanism we use here in the university just to test you as a, as a gate, as a step on the way to your progress towards the end of this course. But to me, the actual learning takes place in those two hours, in this, what, sorry, that one hour that you just had in the collaborative part, where you've seen different perspectives. On it. Okay, so I hope that was a good process and an enjoyable one and something that you've benefited from. We have a third announcement from Dwight. Hi, how you doing? Uh, my name is Dwight Howland and uh, I teach the uh, 4W course, uh, Capstone on, uh, I guess, uh, wastewater treatment. So I've taught this, uh, this will be my fifth year. And uh, this year um, we're going to introduce something new into the course. Uh, some of the students in the course will be integrated as part of the uh, student design competition uh, through the, uh, that's organized by uh, Water Environment Association of Ontario in association with the Water Environment Federation, which is kind of like a North American uh, organization that all water professionals uh, are, are, are associated with. So um, my understanding is that everyone in their last year Chem Edge pretty much is in this classroom right now. Is that is that about right? Show of hands, uh, who who's planning? There are three streams for 4W. Who's planning on going into the uh, into the wastewater treatment uh, stream? Okay, so uh, I saw about maybe 10, 15 hands. Uh, so this will be my fifth year. There's always 30, 30 students every year I've taught the course, so there'll be probably twice as many of you. Um, what I'm looking for is uh, to make this work. Uh, those of you who are interested in working in the future in, uh, in the environmental engineering field, and, and more specifically, water treatment, I think this is a great opportunity uh, for you to not only take the course, the capstone course, but have that uh, be in, uh, get wider recognition within the uh, water uh, field. Uh, so there's a conference that takes place in April uh, of 2015, where those who are involved in the student design competition will be presenting their designs, which are related to a real problem for the City of Toronto at the Ashbridges Bay Treatment Plant. Uh, to be involved in that student competition, however, uh, I have to enroll a team, which I've done under the name of uh, Capstone Course uh, McMaster 4W, but there's also a mandatory site visit of the Ashbridges Bay Treatment Plant, uh, which will take place next Saturday. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, normally I would just wait until the class starts in January for those of you who would be taking my class. 
Uh, but time is of the essence now. If you are interested in this course, 4W Wastewater Treatment, and you are interested in a student design competition, uh, you need to be at that site visit uh, next Saturday. Uh, so, go ahead. Everyone in this class is attending a conference next Saturday? I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, well, um, and are you interested in the student design competition? Okay. So, um, let's deal with that in a moment. First of all, show of hands uh, of those of you who plan on taking the wastewater 4W course uh, in January, who is interested in a student design competition? <coughs> Yeah, just a moment. Uh, could you put your hands higher? I just want to see. If, so there is interest. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. I, I'm interested in it. We looked into it last year, but two questions. One, would it require starting a project this term, I assume, a capstone project? Uh, it doesn't necessarily require it, no. And I know SDC is due in like March usually. That means the capstone, those, those are also due earlier than standard. So the way I would organize the class is not everyone in the class is going to be in the student design competition. So I'm going to make the two, uh, I'm going to make the, the coursework for the capstone course uh, compatible with the student design competition, but not identical. Yeah. So you'll be able to uh, complete the class within the time frame of the class, but the student design competition deliverables will be on a parallel track. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so if you are interested in the student design competition, um, and you have to attend this conference, maybe you can get together with a group of people who are also interested and find a representative who can attend the site tour uh, on your behalf. That, that would be one, one way of uh, approaching that. Any other questions about that? So I spoke, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, if you go to the, the site tour, are you, are you at that point willing to do that no. screen? No, you're not. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it's probably, uh, I mean, if you get your hard hat and your, and your steel-toed boots, it's, it's probably a, a good part of your education to, to have a site tour of a wastewater treatment plant anyhow. Uh, that being said, uh, I did speak with the organizers, and they do have to have plant staff on site on a Saturday to, uh, to guide the tour. So I've reserved a spot for five, five people. So really, I, I, I want, uh, that's flexible, plus or minus, but I, I want people who are, have a, a serious interest in the student design competition to be, to be attending. Is that the way reach you like? Uh, yeah, so that's what I was going to do next. Uh, yeah, so my email, dh. And the key words for this, if you're interested in reading up on it, that's it. So, um, yeah, go ahead, sir. So, um, a couple of friends and I already registered for this competition. Okay. And the rules is like one group for this month as well, like school. So, what's going to happen? So uh, I was told that you're allowed more than one group for school. Okay, so that's okay. Uh, if, if we have a number of people in, in 4W who are interested in it, then they can all do the project. Um, and what we'll do is we'll maybe have a presentation at the end of the class and have a jury select which team is, is best to represent uh, the 4W class. But we can have more than one entry from McMaster is my understanding. Okay. Uh, I think around five. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm looking for is uh, maybe you take the weekend to think about it. You can shoot me an email. I, I am uh, easily accessible by email. Uh, but I'd, I'd like a commitment uh, by Tuesday. Um, and then we can look at uh, travel to Toronto to visit, to visit Ashbridge's Bay. Sound good? Thank you, uh, Professor. Thanks, Dwight.
Thanks, Mirto. Okay, so we're starting a new section now. Uh, the midterm wraps up the economics part for us, and we're looking at a new section on operability. So those notes are posted a, a while back on the website, and hopefully you've had a chance to print them out. Now, this topic takes a while to sink in, um, and I will actually say the following. The most effective way that you're going to spend the next few weeks in this course, actually pretty much to the end of the semester, is not to be sitting back there. The best seats in the house are right up here. There's going to be a lot of board work, a lot of detailed drawing, engineering drawings with superimposed additional layers being added. Okay, so sitting back there is not the best spot. Um, the next few weeks are also incredibly interactive. Um, so we should aim for that and again, the best seats for that would be here at the front. So operability takes a while to sink in. And maybe the one way I can illustrate it, I'll use two analogies. The first one is to ask you what the following is. What does that device represent over there? What does that remind you of? A light bulb, a heater. Okay, it's telling us that we have an alternating current, a switch, and some form of resistance, and whether this is generating light or heat. It doesn't really matter too much for this example. That does not tell you, though, how to build a functional light switch that you can actually use. Right? Our interpretation of this is that these are wires carrying current. So if you built this as is, and I came here and I touched that switch to turn it closed, I would electrocute myself. Right. It's not a functional circuit, it's a description, it's a pictorial representation of a system that we know as a light switch or as a heater. It's also not that, that great because if this was a heater, there's no mechanism here to control the intensity of the heat being generated. Or if it's a light bulb, it doesn't have a dimmer. So sometimes we like that on our dimmers, on, on our light bulbs, for additional functionality. Right? And that's not shown over there. So when we look at PNIDs, drawings of process diagrams, that does not tell us about how the plant functions and how it operates and what makes it work well. Okay? And that's what this section is about, is I'm going to convince you that even though I provided you an entire flow sheet for the course project, and even if I had provided you an Aspen simulation of it, that plant would not work. What might be a little bit eye-opening over the next few weeks is that things that you've learned in engineering and chemeng are not actually built that way. Okay? They don't actually operate that way. We're going to actually look at how systems are built and operated and why that's the case. Okay? So there's reasons for why we've taught things the way we have up to now in your undergraduate course, but we're going to really take that a, a, a big step further in this section of the course. So an equivalent analogy might be, um, might be a car, right? A car, four wheels, steering wheel, okay? That would be the crudest form of a vehicle. And you can build that yourself at home. But you wouldn't be able to drive it down the 401 or on the 407, nor on Main Street or King Street, okay? You wouldn't work well to drive that homemade vehicle, that four wheels and a steering wheel, in icy conditions or in rain. You'd get wet. You couldn't ride it around a high-speed racetrack, okay? So Formula One type of competition. We need our chemical plants to do that. So if you take the car analogy and take it to a chemical plant, right, we need our chemical plants to work 
when we're operating at low speeds or low throughput, we're only producing, say, 20 tons per day. But I also need that same chemical plant, that same piece of equipment, that same reactor, heat exchanger, distillation column, tanks, storage vessels, valves, and sensors to work when I'm operating at 200 tons per day, for example. Right? So it's the equivalent of driving down the 40 kilometer per hour suburb street versus the racetrack, Formula One. Right? We need our plants to be operating under both conditions. We need our plants to be operating in a safe manner. Right? When you have an accident in a motor vehicle, it's usually you'll survive. Okay? We're pretty good with our technology on that. Right? So the probability of surviving an accident is pretty high. In a chemical plant, we have the same possibility of occurrence. So an operator, how many decisions per minute is an operator making? Anyone seen an operator behind their dashboards in a chemical plant, or any plant for that matter? Co-op terms, you've seen those big screens, the operator sitting there. Probably just high school education. But what are they doing? They're controlling everything going on in that plant. Moderating levels, checking for problems, preemptively fixing problems before they become catastrophic. We give them a lot of responsibility. They're making decisions pretty much once every minute, maybe more frequently. Right? How many decisions do you make a day that are unsuccessful? Okay. How many decisions are we relying on an operator to make successfully? All of the decisions all of the time. Will they make successful decisions all of the time? Definitely not. Do we want the plant to cause damage to the environment and the people around us based on those incorrect decisions? Okay. We want the plant to still be operating fairly decently. We use the term robust. Okay, so you've heard, you may have seen this term, robust operation. Any, any thoughts, any, what does that word mean to you? So, something around, around disturbances? Okay. Okay, so even if you have disturbances coming into, and impacting your process, you won't have a bad outcome. The plant is stable in some way, yeah. Okay, so robustness is a term that sometimes people use as an alternative to when we're talking about operability. But operability is a little bit more descriptive, a bit broad, and so we'll tend to use that analogy. Okay, let's go back to the car example. The car example, four wheels and a, and a steering wheel, right? Now we can make things a little bit nicer. We can give it gears, and we can maybe even make it automatic versus manual, right? And we can have power steering. These are nice to have things. So back in the 70s and 80s when I was learning to drive, or a little bit later, we didn't always have those features in vehicles. Now they're standard, heated seats, right? It doesn't, it's not an essential item, but it makes makes the operation of that device um, something that you can enjoy doing, right? So we can add on to our plant in some ways to make it work in a bit more flexible way. So we'll use this term flexibility as well. Okay, so we would like to, that's a desirable feature we're looking for. Now, we also, if we look at our plant, uh, back to the, the car example, we also have ABS braking on our cars, right? assisting us during a sudden emergency brake. We do the same thing to our chemical plants. We add safety features so that when that operator makes the mistake, something is there to catch it in an automatic way. So ABS braking is not something that you think about when you're driving. When you need to brake on an icy surface, the car does that. You've all felt that kind of shaking motion. If you've driven with someone who's braked suddenly on ice, you feel that car vibrating. It's the ABS kicking in. Okay? It's automatic. You don't, you don't have to think about it. It it's, it's comes in for free. Okay? Safety systems in our plant, 
They're not something that the operator needs to flip a switch to turn on. Safety systems are always on, and they're always, another term coming in, reliable. Okay, so we're going to see the term reliability coming up. In fact, we're going to have a guest lecture talking to us next week on that, Dr. Tom Marlin, on reliability. Okay, so we, we, these are features that are all wrapped up in this concept of operability or robust operation. Now, let me perhaps try to take this to an engineering, chemical engineering example, and I'm going to ask you to take a look at this picture. Okay, so there's some questions up there, some text. You can ignore that for now. But I want you to take a look at those four drawings. The first question that I have for you is, what is the purpose those are four options, four alternatives, all doing the same thing. What is the purpose of every one of those? What's its, what's its goal? Okay, so I'll give you a minute. Take a look at that. Discuss it maybe. What is happening in each one of those drawings? Okay, so what is every one of those options are doing the same thing. What is it that it's doing? It's very simple. This don't, don't complicate it. Is it controlling it? Do you see a control loop? Okay, so it's not controlling. It's moving fluid from one position to another position. Okay, every single one of these options, all that it's doing is moving fluid from the beginning to the end. And it is not, it's not controlling it, but it's regulating it. There's a, there's every one of those options has a valve in, in the flow path in some way to regulate the flow. But it's not, a, it's not controlling it in the sense of an automatic control loop. Okay? It, if, you, if you use the word control, you're probably using the word um, manual control. So thinking of it manually, an operator going up. What is a strength and a weakness of every option? So this is going to be a little bit of a discussion, two, three minutes that you need to, to take. A, B, C, and D, what is a strength and what is a weakness? So lots of discussion here.
Okay, so let's hear it. Some strengths of the first option. Simple. Simple. Okay. There's a flow meter, so you get an indication of how much flow there is. And correlated with simplicity is cost, so it's cheap. Okay, so cheap, simple, and you get a visual indication of flow. Let's maybe jump over to option C, which is similar. What is option C's difference to option A is obviously there's no flow meter, but there's an extra valve. What's happening there? Okay, so perhaps for reg you get a second chance at regulating it, maybe. Okay. Any other? Yeah, Mark. The difference between the valve and the umbrella thing. Okay, <laughs> the difference between the valve and the umbrella thing. Okay, so the valve with the with the cap drawn on it there, that's an automatic valve. It gets signals from elsewhere in the process and can be controlled remotely. Okay, so it can be used for regulating the flow in a controlled way. The one with the umbrella. umbrella. <laughs> okay, it's not a technical term. Um, so what's the, what's the advantage then of option C? What is, what's that extra valve doing there? Andrew? Is it more reliable? It, why do you say it's more reliable? You have a second option. If one doesn't work, you have another valve. Okay, so if this valve breaks, the automatic valve breaks, you have another valve that you can go manually change. Adam, do you have some? Or Matt? Um, I think it's actually less reliable because if that's a, well, if you're pumping right and it's trying to flow into the valve and you close that off, the backlash is actually going to flow. So it's not really reliable. Even if you can control it, but yeah. Okay, so the operator could come and by mistake close that up. Yeah, especially with that control valve damage, right? So you don't want to have flow going through. Okay. So th we're going to talk about safety and operator mistakes. But yes, yeah, clear. Right, so if, uh, and that's one of the main reasons why this upstream valve is here, is these automatic valves need to be maintained and replaced fairly frequently on a scale of frequency that uh, talk, Dr. Marlin will talk about. But when we need to replace that valve, right, I can come here and shut this off and change that valve. Compare that to option A. If option A, if I need to go control, uh, change that control valve, I have to shut down the entire process. Uh, we can't go change a live valve. So in option A, that's a disadvantage then of that first one is I can't actually maintain that automatic valve. The maintenance on that valve is impossible without shutting down the entire process. Okay. We're going to see this as a frequent topic coming up. A chemical plant as built on your Aspen flow sheet will not be able to run like that because on your Aspen flow sheets, you don't see all these extra valves. You just draw one valve. But in practice, that's not how it's built. Okay, we have multiple valves. So let's take a look then at option B. What's going on over there? Why those extra valves? Why, those, why that bypass? Should I? Okay, if you do need maintenance here, I can close this first valve, close that final valve, isolate the control valve in the middle, open the bypass, and still keep the process running while maintaining it. This is like kind of filling up your car with gas or doing maintenance on the engine while it's still running. Okay. We like to do that to our chemical plants. We need to do that to our chemical plants. We cannot afford to shut them down to do minor maintenance of this sort. Okay, so that bypass still allows operation of the plant, and an operator can go stand there at that bypass valve and manually adjust it by looking at the flow. So the operator can still regulate that flow manually for the temporary time it takes to replace the control valve. Okay, so now we've gone from one valve to four. Our costs have gone up quite a bit. And this option D 
here, that extra valve we'll learn a bit more in the safety section. But in the safety section, we'll learn that often these control valves, they don't seat 100%. What I mean by that is if you want to close it fully, it doesn't reach the bottom fully to stop the flow completely. So in an emergency, we'll send signals to trigger both valves shut, and we get a guarantee that that, is, that line is closed. Okay, so that might be carrying a fuel, there's a spill, and this is going off to a fired heater, there's an open flame, you've got fuel going to that fired heater, you need to shut it down in an emergency. We'll look at a case study, a video, Texas City, where something like that would work really well. Yeah, sure. I just thought of any time that's right now, but if they don't 100% block the flow, two valves that don't 100% block the flow can 100% block it together, right? Well, this one will seat mostly to the bottom. Yeah, that'll slip it through. And then that one will it pretty much get most of it, but it's going to certainly catch the majority. Right? So, so it's, not, it's like 99% of 99%. Okay. Yeah, type of idea. And what we will do, if this is truly a critical line, we will use a different technology here that to make sure that that's seated 100%. Yeah, we'll like block it fully shut, okay? Okay, so notice there that in our thinking, we've covered a lot of bases here. We've covered the idea of cost, simplicity, they sort of, co they go hand in hand. Reliability of this overall system, flexibility, We've got different options with flexibility. The moment we add a bypass, we give ourselves a lot of flexibility to move that process around. Okay, So all of this is our topics we're going to see coming through over the next few classes. Now, let's go back, let's go, yes, sorry, Andrew. Right, in terms of cost and simplicity, obviously it's the, the least number of units. Every, every item is a probable um, point of breakdown. So in terms of reliability, they would be inversely related, but in terms of cost and simplicity, it follows the natural ranking. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll look at quantifying reliability numerically. There's a really nice way of doing it, following parallel circuits and series circuits to qualify quantify reliability. So we'll see that coming up. Okay, so Dr. Marlin will talk about failure probabilities and we'll calculate the overall reliability of the system. Okay, so this slide is a key one. And it explains why for the course project I've given you everything. I've given you a full flow sheet, all the mass balances, all the energy balances. That's not the focus of a design project. There's a whole lot more to a project, and that's what we're focusing on in this course. Because what happens is a company may decide to set a requirement for producing a certain product. So a certain amount of maleic and hydride, thalic and hydride needs to be produced 80 tons per year. Oh, sorry, 80, um, what was the, the mass flow for the course project? 800 hours of operation producing 100,000 metric tons per year. Right? So that's your base case that you set for yourself. And you select the technology to do so, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So it's the, you set the order of the reactors, the separators that you're going to use. Your structure, do you have recycles, do you have bypasses? And you go ahead and you simulate the flow sheet in Aspen or HISIS, and you go and design the equipment. By the time you start construction, and building that plant, everything has changed from the very first day when you had the idea to build the plant. The market for that product is different. The availability of the raw materials that you anticipated are different. So that raw material that you had anticipated getting from another country at a certain purity level may not even exist anymore and may not be, be possible to, to buy. Along the way, decisions have, have come, and during construction have come, that have made your base case that you started with very, very different to what you 
actually ended up building. And this is where the topic of operability plays its important role, is operability and taking into account operability is what allows us to successfully still build a plant that even though things are very different to when we started, that plant still actually works. Right? So we've built in flexibility into our plant. We build in reliability. We build in safety features to make that plant work successfully still so that it's still operable but different from that base case we started with. Okay, so let's take a look at, at some of these concepts coming through. Okay, so when, when we set a base case, our base case here isn't for a certain single digit per year. So for example, in the project outline that you have, it calls for malic uh, thalic anhydride of 100,000 metric tons per year. That's not actually how base cases are specified. Oh, sorry, that's not how specifications are actually given. That's your single number base case. But a specification for a chemical plant will always have a range. So we will say we're designing for 100,000 tons, but we're going to make sure that that plant can produce from 40,000 tons per year up to 100,000. So we're allowing that plant to operate not only at the target but also below it. It's very critical to be able to operate below your target. Right? It's no different to taking your car and saying, we're designing the car to operate on the 407 highway at 140 kilometers an hour. You also want it to be able to drive at 10, 15 kilometers an hour when you're parking the car and moving it in a parking garage. Okay? So it has to operate at everything in between and successfully transition from a low speed to a high speed and a high speed back to low. So let me... Th I w here, let me emphasize what the analogy, how it converts to a chemical plant. If you think of a fluidized bed, okay, so you've got a picture of a fluidized bed in your mind, operating at 10 meters cubed per hour of fluid. What happens if you turn that down? Dylan? It won't be fluidized at all pretty much. After a certain point, you cannot maintain those particles in suspension. The process essentially operates at target, a little bit above, a little bit below, but it's not a flexible unit. Okay? It's not a flexible unit at all. A fluidized bed collapses once you cannot suspend your particles and you're not operating it at the throughput required. Okay, so if you're designing for 100,000 tons per year and your only reactor in your system is a fluidized bed, it's essentially saying you've got to be able to take your car from zero to 140 kilometers an hour and you can only drive at 140, 000, 140 kilometers an hour. You can't move around there too much. Okay. So what do we do when we need to move to a slower flow rate? How would you solve that problem if you needed to operate that plant at half that production? How does that play into point number two, your process technology? Discuss an alternative that you would think of if you had to operate it at half the speed. What was your question? We're assuming that that's already the, the hundred, like the peak, yeah.
Okay, so let's hear some ideas. Here's the, here's the problem. We've got the need to treat 100 liters cubed per hour of fluid passing through here. These particles are being held in suspension due to that volumetric flow rate. If I take Q and I need to halve it, I'm not holding those particles in suspension. The entire bed collapses and it's as good as turning it off. What are my options to... I do need to tr run at 50 meters cubed per hour. Maybe the demand for my product is not quite as strong as I'd hoped. I've got to scale back. How do I operate at half that volumetric flow rate? Some ideas. Run multiple smaller reactors in parallel. Okay, run multiple smaller reactors in parallel. Yeah, I was going to say decrease the size of the reactor. Decrease the size, but we, st we still need to also work at the higher flow rate. Right, so you've got to design one or design a plant to operate at a range of specs, Mark. It's not the best way to treat them, but to like have storage tanks and just different things and just kind of like design and store it. Okay, so have a storage vessel up front. Yeah. Okay. Could we substitute an inert fluid in there, so still get 100 meters cubed an hour, but half of it is maybe nitrogen or not, not reacting? Can I maybe take that a step further and consider what if you just took the stream at the top right? There's an alternative. And you adjust your recycle flow rate to keep it up. So one unit with a bypass and a recycle. Oh, not a bypass, just a recycle, I should say. Okay, the idea of multiple reactors, that's a possibility. We could have three or four parallel fluidized beds and bring them on, on as needed, right? So we're changing now capital costs. We're going to pay more for having four fluidized beds that are smaller, but that's tremendously flexible. So thinking of flexibility now, you can bring fluidized bed one, two, and three on when you need to run at 75% capacity and scale them on and off as needed. The other really nice advantage of having multiple beds is that you can always take one down for maintenance and the other three can keep running. If you have a single fluidized bed reactor and that's your entire plant, that's the bottleneck, everything passes through the single fluidized bed, you have to shut down the entire plant when you want to maintain the fluidized bed. Okay. So you're starting to see the trade-off between flexibility and reliability here. We'd like to be flexible enough to take units on and off for maintenance. The idea that Mark suggested of storage vessels is a really interesting one, and it also gives us flexibility, because what we could do now is take our feed, stockpile it, grow this level, increases to a certain height. When we get to enough capacity, I can turn this on, run it, and drain that tank down, and then turn the fluidized bed off. Okay. So lots of options that we have here. But you'll never see this in your Aspen flow sheet. They won't put a storage tank there. They'll just say, you feed it into a fluidized bed and you run it. But that's not how actual plants are run. We always have these intermediate vessels to help for flexibility. Okay. At some additional cost, but that cost is totally worth it. Okay, now I want you to also think a little bit of, along these lines. What happens, um, Chris had mentioned here earlier that there's disturbances in a plant. Okay, we're talking about robustness. Robustness is related to disturbances. Every engineer's primary job in a company actually is troubleshooting and solving problems. Okay. Most of anyone who's done a co-op job and you've watched any of the engineers that are employed at that company, most of the time they're not designing heat exchanges or implementing control loops. They're fighting fires and solving problems and troubleshooting. What causes those problems and troubles? Okay, Mark mentioned two things, mistakes and over wearing out, things wearing out over time. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. 
Okay, so people using vessels for different reasons that they were originally intended for. Yeah, so a, a mistake or an error. Oh, Matt? The raw material has changed. You're now getting it from a different supplier with different impurities that you didn't anticipate. Okay. Nostalgia? If the specs for your product change, right? Your, your, your biggest client comes and says to you, I need this not at 98% purity, I need it now at 99.5% purity. Right? So now you need to push your process a little bit more. This, you're not going to build a whole new plant just for that client, but can you use your existing equipment and push it a little bit further? So your output specifications change. That's a disturbance. Errors, mistakes from your operator. Anything else that's happening to a plant over time? So you're trying out something new that doesn't behave the way you expect it to, okay? So that's an intentional change that you've gone and made to your process. Other things that are happening by themselves without you doing anything. Mark? Changing cycles of things, like your utilities. Uh, your utilities. Okay, so your utilities are fluctuating. Shavis? Okay, that's a good one. We have lots of disturbances from the environment in Canada. Huge temperature swings, okay? Your heat exchanger is going to operate very differently, your outdoor heat exchanger is going to operate very differently in minus 20 degrees and plus 30 degrees. Right? You're getting some whole lot of free cooling in the winter that's not there in the summer anymore. I'll come back here. Maintenance, so things break down and you suddenly have to maintain them. Corrosion, fouling. Okay, so heat exchanger fouling. Membranes foul. Do distillation columns foul? Yeah, distillation column trays build up all sorts of gunk on them, right? And the companies have to shut them down every so often to clean them out. Okay, so natural disturbances and changes that you have absolutely no control over. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything going towards maximum entropy. You don't have to do anything, it just does it for free, right? So all of that's taking, taking place. Now here's the problem, right? We all know that companies shut down their processes for maintenance. But let's take a look at, at, the, at that over time. Okay, so let's take a, a hypothetical case of a heat exchanger and let's presume you could look into that heat exchanger and you could see the efficiency. Okay, we don't have an instrument or a device to do this, but let's pretend we could. And when you buy that heat exchanger, it's maybe at 95% efficiency. And over time, it's doing that. And it's dropping maybe to 40% efficiency. And then you stop the process, you clean it out, clean the heat exchanger, and you get that happening. And that may be a, a one-year cycle, it might be a two-year cycle that's drawn over there. The problem is, if you're producing phthalic anhydride at 100,000 tons per year, you need to do so at this point in time, this point in time, this point in time, and even at that point in time. Your customer is not interested in your heat exchanger being fouled. Your customer is only interested in them getting the product delivered to them on time at the specifications that they need it. So we call this end of run. So when your process is in its worst possible condition, right there just the day before you shut it down, you still need to be able to be meeting your target production. So end of run production is still critical. So we've, we've, what this lecture has gone and done is I've introduced you to a variety of concepts that are all playing into robustness and operability. Okay, we're going to look into those in a little bit more detail over the coming few classes. Okay? So have a good Thanksgiving, and I'll see you on Wednesday.